Okay. We are going to go into the final session, the preview session we had during lunchtime. We went ahead and um, went through one set of numbers. Enjoy your time. Yeah, that's just going to give those another shot. And we will give those numbers uh, one more shot if any of you weren't here but we do want to speak. And then from there, we'll give a new set of numbers. The idea being that we want to give all of you who sat through today's discussions and have reflections you want to share a chance to do so before we wind up. So let me read through the tickets we have of those who have already been picked, and then we can see if folks would like a chance to be heard. 479, 441, 388, 441411, 464, 392, 409, 385, 424, 485, 462. I hear bingo in the left over there. Just checking if you're listening. 533, 434, 505, 499. All right. I see we have four people lined up. Um, we will start with these four individuals, and then we'll do another round of some of the other tickets um, to see if we have other people. So, yes, uh, two minutes uh, per speaker. If people could please uh, be seated so our speakers have a chance to be heard. And please introduce yourself again. My name is Bill Bridgeforth, and I'm a farmer from... A little louder, Bill. My name is Bill Bridgeforth, and, my, and I'm a farmer from Alabama. We grow cotton, corn, soybeans, wheat, and canola. Each year when we decide what we're going to plant, the, most, the, the, the biggest decision we make is what variety and what seed we will plant. We think we have plenty of choices, and we just choose the ones that we think will give us the best production at the best cost. And so that's my comment, and I appreciate you very much. And we appreciate you making the trip. Thank you very much, Bill. My name is Maurice Parr. I go by the name of Mo Parr. Um, I was sued by Monsanto. I have been in business for 27 years. Uh, after... Uh, 13 years, Monsanto got a patent, supposedly, on their Roundup Ready soybean. Uh, at that time, I put a disclaimer on the receipt that I gave farmers, in which I said on that receipt, as of the date this ticket was printed, the U.S. Congress, through the federal seed laws, has expressly protected the right of farmers to save seed that they have produced to replant on ground they own, lease, or rent, Certain seed slash chemical companies attempt to circumvent those rights by requiring farmers to sign agreements giving up those rights in order to purchase certain brands or types of seeds. Custom seed cleaning, which is what I call my business, custom seed cleaning is not a party to those agreements and will in no way hold itself responsible for enforcement or compliance of said agreements. Monsanto sued me in federal court, alleging that I encouraged, embedded, aided, and aided, abetted, encouraged, and enticed the farmer to break the patent law. I, I am guilty of giving the farmer a copy of the Supreme Court decision, uh, January the 18th of 19, uh, 1996, uh, authored by uh, Judge Justice Anton Scalia, in which nine of the judges concurred, eight of the judges concurred with his opinion that the farmer was allowed to save seed. They did not say, that the, the, the uh, justices did not say except for genetically modified, except for Roundup Ready, except for anything. As far as I'm concerned, the Supreme Court uh, 
the American people through the Congress in passing the law, and uh, President Nixon in signing that law gave the, protected the right of farmers to save their own seed. Monsanto has essentially ruined my business. When the patent runs out in 19, I'm sorry, in 2014, I'll be 80 years old. I probably will not be cleaning a lot of seed after I'm 80 years old, but in the meantime, I've lost my business. I don't know that uh, Henry David Thoreau was an attorney, but I kind of like the attitude that he had in his book on civil disobedience, in which he said that a person has the right and the moral obligation to disobey laws that are unjust. I see this as an unjust law. I'm not certain that they have a right to uh, patent on a living organism. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joel Greeno, dairy farmer from Kendall, Wisconsin. Please speak up, Joel. Okay, yep. That better? Better? All right. I'm Joel Greeno, dairy farmer, Kendall, Wisconsin, uh, national president of the American Raw Milk Producers Pricing Association, serve on the executive committee of the National Family Farm Coalition, and founder of Scenic Central Milk Producers. And I first want to thank the U.S. Justice and Agricultural Departments for hosting this historic series of workshops. I'm encouraged that the departments are taking a serious look at the consequences of concentration on farmers like myself. However, with the magnitude of these problems, it is clear that we need an additional hearing focused on seeds with adequate, adequate time for farmers to speak. Uh, I'm here to be the voice of the voiceless. Uh, my parents, whose farm was sold at sheriff's auction and uh, on the courthouse steps, for the New York State dairy farmer who in mid-January went into his barn and shot 51 of his cows and then himself. For my neighbor who was 62 years old, stopped at my farm last week and asked how he could get on food stamps. He and his sister were stripped of their family's dairy farm last year, owned since 1942, and he said the $9,000 he was getting from Social Security didn't pay his bills. My life has value, my work has value, and the products I produce have value. And corporations like Monsanto and Kraft do not have the right to dictate the value of my work. Our nation's farmers' lives are right now in the hands of the Department of Justice and the USDA. You people have a choice to make uh, people first and uh, corporations last. <clears throat> and, and the bottom line of this is simple. Farmers must receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit from the marketplace, not from subsidies and other programs that fall horribly short and are grossly inadequate. Uh, GMO companies are taking control of the world seed supply, aligning themselves to benefit financially from every seed sold in the world. <clears throat> And the uh, <clears throat> and uh, and also from the patenting of life. What better way to profit than own the source of all the food we eat? They have reduced my options for non-GMO seed. Many of my options left have no practical use on a dairy farm, and GMOs of, are of no value when fed to dairy cattle. <clears throat> GMOs have increased my cost to raise corn due to Monsanto's purchase of Holden seed, taking control of much of corn's uh, seed true base stock, nearly doubling the cost of my seed. All this at a time when milk prices are at their all-time worst. The last thing we need is increased costs with absolutely uh, no benefit. <clears throat> I'm urging the Departments of Agriculture to broaden the scope of their investigation and actions being considered to include congressional and administrative actions such as removing utility patents on seed and seed genetics, transferring liability for economic damage resulting from protecting crop varieties to the patent holder, and reinvigorating public cultivar development. Of course, it's clear that we need to enforce antitrust law and break up monopolies. 
farmers will not benefit from simple realignment of market shares held by three or four seed companies dominating the industry. These actions must be about restoring farmer choice and farmers' rights. It is important to note that people in my community, including farmers and small seed dealers, breeders and companies, are unwilling to come and testify in public due to fear and intimidation. The culture of fear that exists around patented seed technologies is real and serious. Thank you for the opportunity to provide these comments. Thank you. Hello, my name is Christina Hubbard and I'm the author of this report called Out of Hand, Farmers Face the Consequences of a Consolidated Seed Industry. It was provided to the docket for public comment. Um, first of all, thank you for having this workshop. It's historic um, and I appreciate the agencies coming together, bringing us together um, to talk about these problems. I wanted to echo what um, the last gentleman, gentleman said in that concentration in the seed industry was a pretty small part of today's discussion and I do think it warrants its own hearing with an adequate amount of time for farmers to speak. Um, that said, again, this workshop, again, thank you for, for hosting it. We wrote this report out of hand because many farmers say that the prices they're paying are indeed out of hand for seed. Um, we wrote it because farmers say that their choice, um, their seed options are dramatically reduced, especially in the way of conventional corn and soybean varieties. Um, we're finding that farmers fear that the best and newest genetics will only be introduced with expensive patented traits stacked into them. And this is a problem that needs to be part of this discussion. Um, I'm encouraged that the agencies are talking about examining the role patents play in facilitating concentration in the seed industry. And I, I hope that the focus will not be only on competition within the trade industry, but rather the concentration of ownership over plant genetic resources, over germplasm, the most fundamental piece of agriculture. Uh, Congress long argued that utility pat patents should not be applied to uh, seeds and seed genetics to sexually reproducing plants such as corn and soybeans. And I hope that legislative actions and options are considered in this discussion as well. I think Congress should revisit the Plant Variety Protection Act and clarify that that should be the sole protection for plant developers producing uh, these crops. Um, and just a reminder, uh, patents remove a farmer's right to save seed. A farmer's ability to save seed is a form of competition. Um, and, and then lastly on that point, patents are also locking up important genetic resources that public and private plant breeders alike often cannot access to further innovation. Um, lastly, I wanted to speak to something that General Holder said this morning. He said he was encouraging us to be frank about our perspectives. And unfortunately, there are many people here today, um, there, there are many people who aren't here today um, because they are unwilling uh, to speak. They are afraid of repercussions from the dominant players. Um, my colleagues and I have spoken to at least a dozen seed companies, truly independent seed companies, who are worried about talking about the shortcomings of the seed industry. They're worried about simply sharing their story. And so this culture of fear that the last gentleman mentioned is, is truly stifling voices of people who have an important story to share. These are public plant breeders, these are seed dealers, representatives of independent seed companies, and especially farmers. Um, so as people, as people come up to this microphone, those who do have courage to share their perspective, please remember that their voice is a vote, and many of us are voting for a seed industry that meets the diverse needs of farmers and hopefully restores choice and rights back to our American farmers. So thank you. My name is Matthew Dillon. I'm with the Organic Seed Alliance. I'm also a plaintiff in a lawsuit against the U.S. Department of Agriculture, APHIS, for uh, not following the National Environmental Protection Act and its deregulation of Roundup Ready sugar beets. I should say I'm a victor uh, as a plaintiff in that case, and we're in the remedy phase. Uh, I do want to also thank you for uh, these hearings. And as other people have pointed out, seed in particular, I believe we need an additional hearing that's not just focusing on concentration, but that spreads out to take on some of these other issues that are uh, inhibiting farmers' uh, freedom to operate, freedom to operate in their markets. And those issues do include issues of contamination in the marketplace uh, and access to seed. I think it needs to expand out to include uh, USDA APHIS, 
uh, the Patent and Trade Office, the EPA, and congressional oversight for those uh, committees. My understanding of the purpose of having a competitive marketplace, the purpose and the goal, is not to line the pockets of shareholders and overpaid CEOs. The purpose of a competitive marketplace is to serve the needs of a diverse agricultural system. Now, uh, that's not happening, and that's quite clear, particularly in seeds. We once had a diverse seed system that was served um, in a dual role by public and private uh, plant breeders and seed systems. Seed system, public and private systems worked together in partnership and collaboration, but they also competed. Public plant breeders released public cultivars that competed against the private industry, and that in particular served small and emerging markets in the, pub the public sector uh, varieties. That hasn't happened. Um, and there's two things that's both inhibiting the public and private sector from being diverse. In the private sector, as many people have pointed out, and I won't belabor the point, the utility patent is the strongest tool that's creating monopolies and inhibiting the development of regional diverse seed companies that can be competitive. In the public sector, the Bayh-Dole Act needs to be examined. The Bayh-Dole Act has changed funding for our federal, our, our public land grant uh, institutions so that they are beholden to private companies for their uh, plant breeding dollars, their research dollars. And we need to have uh, an audit of the Bayh-Dole Act to examine whether or not it is actually doing its job or it's in inhibiting uh, innovation and research. That needs to be done. Um, it needs to be done soon. Um, we need an industry that's really going to be responsive to minor and emerging markets. And you guys mentioned niche markets and organic and local markets as niche. Well, organic is not a niche market. It's the fastest growing market in the United States. We're not hiding in a corner. We're, we're out in front. And we're in innovative and leading the charge. American markets are supposed to be about innovation. Organic has innovated. They've taken risk. They've made investments. They've been successful. But we need the protection and the freedom to operate. We don't have access to seed. The majority of organic farmers plant conventional seed. We're reliant on biotech companies to lease our inbred lines for organic corn production. And yet we can't even test these inbred lines because of intellectual property rules to determine if these inbred lines are contaminated. So organic seed companies are planting inbred lines that we know are contaminated with bi biotech traits and further contaminating our marketplace and hurting our customer base and our credibility. So this has to be a bigger issue. I applaud you for what you've done, but we need to go a step forward and expand this dialogue out. Thank you very Thank much. You. I'm Scott Remington uh, from Winterset, Iowa. I've been a cattle producer primarily for ever since I was 12 years old. I have owned a cow before I even bought a car. And what the issues I see here today, we've talked a lot about life, the ownership of life. There's really essentially the conflict here. And where I came from, in my experience, I've also worked as a consultant for natural fertilizers and, and, and working with the natural biological ways. And I do know that well. And today, I thank you for being here, though, because this is encouragement that we are actually having dialogue. And we have a lot of points of opinion here. But you know, on the simplistic side, I won't repeat what other people said more eloquently, eloquently than I did. We have a rigged system. There's no question in my mind. And if we looked at history, history repeats itself. We had to crush the corporations in the late 1800s. It came back around. And, but today, it's, it, it's, it's at the most critical time, because now what we're doing, in my expertise with the soil, is that we aren't even regarding the life in the soil. We have had no, no talks about the biological system that made Iowa's soil as deep as it was. It wasn't corn, beans, corn, beans, corn, beans. It was the tall grass prairie. And that's not being just tree hugging and stuff. That is a biological fact. We've gotten away from the system of agriculture, of sustainability, so far. 
And as a consultant and doing soil tests and working with a lot of different clients over years, we one of the greatest losses we're having is our topsoil. We cannot chase, we're a dog chasing his tail with, with relying on biotech. And I'm not against that. But my golly, do you have to really be careful. And my testimony today is that the, we can't even drink out of the wells safely in the state of Iowa on our farms. We had to get rural water because the, the nitrates and the pesticides and everything. That's a fact. When you talk to people on the coast that don't know it, and if we tell them that we can't, the majority of our wells in the state aren't safe to drink, well, what kind of food are we sending? So there's a little bit of twist, but you know, I thank you for being here, but this is life, this is all of us, urban, rural, wherever we are, and we're supposed to be the leader in agriculture in the world. We're actually failing very miserably. You know, but, you know, everyone that came here, and I thank you very much, and thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Thank you. And my name is Harvey Howington, and I own and manage a rice and soybean farm in Poinsett County, Arkansas. Time, is t time to talk is short, so I will get right to the point. Utility patents are a failed experiment. The seed companies told us they needed the patents to justify spending the research money needed to advance this cutting edge technology. They will tell us we need GMOs to feed a growing world. I agree we need GMO technology, but the products the companies are bringing to the marketplace are not the products needed to feed the world. They are all about company profits. The companies will say average yields go up every year. That is because farmers who can't get the maximum yield out of the varieties are not around next year. Hundreds of farmers go broke every year and rural America is drying up. As for that promised research money, I strongly suspect the companies are spending far more on enforcing those patents than they do developing varieties. The lawyers get most of the money. Seed costs have skyrocketed. We lost the thing farmers and inhabitants of this planet that is most precious to us, and that is the intellectual property rights to our food. As a southern rice farmer, I would like to comment about a practice that negatively affects the price farmers get for their crop. Large farmer cooperatives will swap rice with each other and other large private rice firms to avoid going to the marketplace to buy rice. They will in the future pay them back in kind or for a reduced price after the market has dropped. This predatory market practice masks demand for rice. It allows the companies to pay less than market price for rice. We think it could also be a violation of the Capra Volstead Act for the cooperatives to do this. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Sam Kearney. <clears throat> I'm a farmer from Adair, Iowa. Is that working? Try again. There we go. Fourth generation farmer. In 1998, 99, I brought my son into the operation. As you know, what happened to pig prices? My banker called me in. He says, you got to quit this bleeding the red. He says, we need to do some risk management with you. So we've done risk management for the past 10, 11 years, and it's worked very well for us. It's made us a very successful business. I don't want to lose those options. I don't want those taken away. I can take my pigs, I can contract with the packer, and I get along very well. And I don't necessarily use the same packer time after time. I use a variation of different packers. I need those options. I have to provide my banker with cash flows and make sure I have a risk management tool. With today's volatile markets, and as we've seen last year, when H1N1 hit, and nobody was going to predict that, we've seen what the markets did. We've got to have a risk management tool. So please, I ask you, don't take that away so my son and I can keep operating. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, <clears throat> John Weber, uh, pork producer from uh, Dysart, Iowa. Just want to make a couple of comments uh, on what I've heard today. I've jotted down a few notes. 
while significant, significant consolidation has occurred, especially in the pork industry, I think it's fully, it's fully in, um, important to understand the forces that brought this consolidation about. Um, I, I, uh, I often think about this, uh, it, there, there's a multitude of forces that brought consolidation about. It wasn't just the bottom line of the people doing it. Um, I think we can be very proud in this country of the products that we're producing, uh, the food and the quality of the food we're producing uh, all the way through. And part of it is due to some of the efficiencies that we have gained through this consolidation process. So I don't want to jeopardize um, our food production system, not only for us here in, in this country, but for those abroad. The other thing is that in my area and throughout the Midwest, there are thousands of producers that depend on these types of systems or contractual arrangements. We happen to own the pigs that we feed in our operation, but we are definitely part of a production contract system. And I've been in that system for 16 years, and it's been very successful for me, and I know for quite a few other producers in our area. And I really, from a producer, don't want to lose that ability. I know several producers that would not be in business if they hadn't had the ability to do that. Our industry needs choices of market systems because there are a wide variety of independent producers as well as those consolidated, and transparency is important to us. I think we have to be very careful of how we develop new programs or new regulations that affect these systems uh, because they will not only affect producers, but they also affect consumers in the price of the food that they're uh, going to pay. <coughs> One last comment I jotted down here at the end. Uh, uh, we talked a lot today about the age of the agricultural producer and, and bringing youth into agriculture. Just a comment I would like to make on that. I think there's avenues that our government could incentivize youth in agriculture. I think it would be wise to help this 65 and older group, um, whether it's through taxation or what it might be, but to give them an incentive to bring new producers into their operations uh, rather than just stepping out. And I think it could be done through a tax structure uh, very, very easily. So those are the comments I had. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Nikki Dahlman, and I'm a certification specialist and inspector for MOSA, Midwest Organic Services Association. We're located, uh, we're an organic certification agency located in Viroqua, Wisconsin. We certify 1,400 organic farmers and producers in 11 states, uh, and we also certify more organic dairy farms than any other NLP accredited agency. I would like to express concern for the potential release of um, GMO alfalfa and the threat it poses to our organic farmers. The concerns surrounding the release of GMO alfalfa are different from those of existing GMO corn because of the way in which alfalfa is pollinated. As certifiers of organic products, we help to ensure the organic integrity of corn crops by determining the distance of the farmer's organic crop from the neighbor's conventional crop which direction the wind blows, what barriers lay between the two fields, and what time of year their crop pollinates versus their neighbor's crop. Likewise, our organic corn breeders are able to maintain the genetic integrity of their seeds by making sure these same barriers are in place. Alfalfa, however, is open pollinated or cross pollinated as opposed to corn, which is a self pollinator, and alfalfa relies mainly on bees to, dist to distribute the pollen. Alfalfa is also a perennial versus an annual crop such as corn, allowing the genetic makeup of a given field to change from year to year. The National Organic Standards Board Apiculture Task Force devised a report in 2001 for farmers wishing to certify organic honey. The report sought to define the forage zone of honeybees, which was established at a 1.8 mile radius from the bee yard with an additional surveillance zone of up to 2.2 miles. This means that there are to be no genetically modified crops within a 2.2 mile radius of the source, as it is believed that anything short of that, despite topo topography or terrain, poses a threat to the organic integrity of the honey. There is no way a certification agency could possibly enforce or monitor these guidelines, nor do we believe we should have to. Alternatively, this means that the organic integrity of alfalfa crops will be jeopardized by genetic contamination, with the degree and implications of the contamination unknown. When a consumer purchases a product with the USDA organic seal on it, 
They believe they are getting a product that contains little to no GMOs and, we're, and was raised without any genetically modified inputs. And they're willing to pay a premium for that product. This premium is what helps keep our 500 family-run organic dairy farms in business, as well as our farmers who sell organic feed and our seed companies who breed organic seed. It is our job as a certification agency to ensure the organic integrity of their crops and their market. And we feel that we are able to do this and to stand behind the organic seal placed on these products. However, we cannot say that this will be the case if GMO alfalfa is introduced with non-regulated status. And that is why I'm here today to express my concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Brad Wilson, Iowa Family Farmer. Uh, you know, I feel like I've heard quite a few political speeches here on the, on the panels. And uh, one of the things they were saying is about how much they want to hear me. Uh, and I listen to that all day long. I don't necessarily see them here now. Uh, you know, I'm out here in this line, and uh, I'm in competition to speak. We have a competitive market out here, and the little fringe that's left, the little bit that's left, a little bit of time left. Whereas up here, we had a protected market where they got to speak. And it just reminds me that you're treating us you at DOJ, you at the USDA are treating us the same way Monsanto treats us. Uh, and, and so I think you need to change the process next time. You, know, you, could, you could have debates where you put us up against your people. I think we can beat your people. And, and have a series of debates, and if you, get, you, if you have high status, you don't get to move on just because you have high status. If you get beat because you don't have the competence, then we get to move up, and we'll be the ones that end up in Washington. If you have that debate, will win that debate, and you should be giving a chance for that truth to come out. Now, you know, we, we kind of had a heads up on some of this here. Uh, when Vilsack was in Iowa, he wrote the nuisance lawsuit protection provisions for House File 519, the hog factory bill. And uh, so that, that got a lot of things going here, giving a legal protection for that kind of a change. We had also, as governor, that was as a legislator, as governor, he, uh, he pushed the Iowa 2010 report. Well, 2010 is here. The 2010 report in Iowa said, we want Iowa to be the life sciences capital of the world by 2010. Now, they probably have copycat reports over in Missouri and Minnesota and all these places. They're saying they want to be the tough, the, well, interpret it, the biggest uh, ag complex in the world. So it's a concentration effort that came from that. Now, if you go to 20, the Iowa 2010 report, volume two, they have from the hearings all of the comments from the people, from, the pe from this kind of a line here, and, and those people said, we don't want that concentrated system. But they weren't heard, and it didn't get into the final report, and that's what I'm kind of hearing here. Uh, now, you know, Lewis Mumford, uh, he, he's a great writer about technology and mega techniques, and he taught us that mega techniques is an authoritarian techniques. And as you hear the thing said out here, you, we, it's very clear that we're already in, in the effects of these authoritarian measures that are coming down at us. And uh, uh, if, if you don't understand, for example, Iowa State University, these other land grant people, the economists, if they don't understand that the technology that we're talking about here is a mega techniques, and if you don't know how that techniques works, that it is authoritarian, then you don't understand technology in agriculture today and in many other sectors of the economy. And I didn't hear anybody up here that understood that. Now, you know, we, we got, maybe we've got some congressional people left, I don't know. but. Uh, I'm used to speaking when everybody's gone home, including the press. Uh, the, uh, in, in, the, in Congress, we have, have a farm bill where they, on purpose, have lowered the price floor down, 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 starting in the 50s to today, uh, and then they lowered it to zero. Now, what that did was that gave cheaper and cheaper and cheaper grain to the big corporations. You know, they talk about farm subsidies where if you, because you're losing so much money every year that you get a subsidy. But these corporations didn't lose any money to go get their bigger benefits. And uh, so here we have that, and that, that fuels this concentration. That's all part of this system, fueling this concentration. That's not the kind of reasons that were given on the panel today. That's a political reason where they chose that. You know, go back to the CED report of 1962 where they said, we want to get rid of one-third of the farmers in five years. And, and so that's, a, that's, that's an authoritarian statement. And they said, I heard all this, you know, talk from your panels about youth. We want our farm youth. The CED report said, we want programs to get rural youth to move away. Now, we've been dealing with that with the NFO and all these groups for decades. Uh, okay, I'll wind this up right now. Uh, right here. Yeah, the, the, the ERS data shows 
that we lost money. Uh, I, I've summed up uh, the five big crops in the, in the farm program and then uh, uh, barley, oats, and, and grain sorghum. From 1981 to 2006, you put in the acres with the, the uh, net per acre. Uh, actually, and, and you sum those up, and we lost money every single year except 1996. So the policy of the United States was that we will export our grain for 25 years at below our cost. That the United States will lose money. At the same time, OPEC said, hey, you know, we got 40% of the market. We'll raise our price. Now, that's an authoritarian system that says the United States will lose money so that these big corporations can benefit all around the way. You know, I really can't thank you for this process. Thank you. Hi, my name is George Naylor. I'm a farmer from Sherdan, Iowa. I'm past president of the National Family Farm Coalition. I think if I'd have been to this meeting 20 or 30 years ago, I'd start out by saying the same thing. Basically, you're closing the door after the horse is out of the barn. Um, and actually, you're closing the door after the horse thieves have stole the horse. These horse thieves have stolen our family farm system. They've stolen the biodiversity of Iowa. They, now they're stealing a decent health care for all of us. They're stealing our, the future of our democracy and the future of our children. There, there's con grave consequences to what these big corporations do with their economic and te technological power. Um, they're Monsanto, and this, this is really the technology we're talking about here, genetic engineering. Okay. Roundup Ready technology is being used to destroy uh, biodiversity in Brazil and all around the world. And now Monsanto is promising to, you, to create corn that is resistant to drought and re resistant to salty soil so as to feed poor people around the world. Well, the truth of the matter is that technology will be used to plant vast areas of corn from horizon to horizon, destroying biodiversity on arid land that never was used to produce uh, crops before. Um, and so the United States is giving Monsanto the right to put this technology out there to let their genes go all around the world and to somehow certify that it's okay for the environment when we know that there's no, there can be no such guarantee. We can't guarantee that it's okay for the environment here in Iowa, let alone in Mexico and South America and Africa and whatever. So the, the what the power that you, that we, give to Monsanto to do what they do, like I said, has grave consequences. Now, personally, I, I was in a lawsuit. I was a plaintiff in a lawsuit with uh, the president of the Iowa Farmers Union, uh, Chris Peterson, 11 years ago, where we brought a suit against Monsanto. Uh, Chris's part of the lawsuit was explicitly an antitrust lawsuit. We said that they had bought up many of their competitors with the intention of monopolizing the, the industry. And um, uh, let's see. Well, anyway, uh, it was an antitrust lawsuit. I'm sorry, I forget the other part of it. But the funny thing is that after the judge had, had uh, dismissed our antitrust lawsuit, it came out in the, in the New York Times that this judge had been a lawyer from Monsanto. And he should have recused himself, but he didn't. Okay, this was an artic in an article by David Barbosa in uh, January 6th and 9th, uh, 2004. David Barbosa also presented plenty of evidence in his articles that the, the CEOs of these major corporations, Pioneer, Syngenta, uh, Monsanto, got together and agreed to charge a uniform price, a price higher than any of them had to charge, okay? which was against the uh, Sherman Antitrust Act, okay? But since the judge said that we couldn't have a class action lawsuit and we could proceed for just one farmer, we couldn't afford to go ahead with the lawsuit. Now I'm asking you, where was the federal government in trying to enforce the Sherman Antitrust Act? And is there any chance that you in your positions, this administration can try to enforce the, the Sherman Antitrust Act based on their activity 
to, to monopolize the market back then. I would just reiterate what Bill Stalling said, um, and uh, Bill, Mark Toby, and I are here. Folks want to talk afterwards. If you have allegations or information, we want to hear it. So okay, well, you, yeah. you can look up the articles by David Barbosa in the New York Times okay. of January 6th and 9th, and you can read about it. Okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I am Marsha Ishi Eitemann. I'm a senior scientist with Pesticide Action Network. And I would principally like to share with you the results of a, a landmark uh, international assessment of agriculture that came out last year. This is the International Assessment of Agricultural Knowledge, Science, and Technology for Development, or the ISTAD report. It was authored by uh, over 400 scientists and development experts from over 80 countries, went through two public and transparent peer review processes, and has been fully approved after an uh, intergovernmental plenary by 58 governments. So it was just published last year. I'll give you a bit of information about this afterwards. But this uh, landmark report already examined in detail the successes and shortcomings of our food and agricultural systems in the US, in North America, and around the world. And it also looked explicitly into the kinds of issues we've been talking about today around competition, the effects of corporate consolidation on our food and agricultural systems, and the impacts of that on farmers, farm workers, consumers, the environment, and so on. So I would just like to draw out a couple, a very few of the, very, of the key findings. One, we've heard a lot about uh, today about the um, contribution of biotechnologies to, quote, uh, feeding the world. And actually, this report examined biotechnologies and a whole range of agricultural technologies in great detail. And the, one of the key findings is that, in fact, the food crisis and the, and the hunger and malnutrition we are seeing in the world today, which is enormous, is not due to a lack of access to the um, GMOs and the biotechnologies that Monsanto is bringing to us and other corporations are bringing to us, but rather to poverty and lack of access to uh, healthy and affordable food. So there are many countries, including our own, that are producing massive amounts of food. The issue is not a need to increase production, but to see that distribution uh, is, is far more equitable. The other thing that the report found was that widespread adoption of, and in fact, particularly patenting uh, and corporate control over the more modern and recent technologies has very directly benefited transnational corporations and the, the wealthier groups and not so much the small scale farmers um, and family farmers. Also, these, some of these technologies have yielded some significant short-term benefits, but they have had significant and growing costs on the environment and our ability as a community and a society to maintain clean soils, clean water, uh, functioning local, vibrant local economies and the health of, of our families and of future generations. And so the question is not so much, you know, can uh, quote unquote sustainable or organic or, or less um, heavily based on inputs, can that kind of agriculture feed the world? But can the kind of agriculture that we are seeing based on these corporate um, control technologies feed the world? And the answer to that last question is, no, the direction we are going in is, is not sustainable. Um, business as usual is not an option. And finally, just to say the report also noted that in North America in particular, growing market concentration in multiple agricultural sectors has now paved the way for near total control of our region's food and agricultural systems by the transnational corporations. And this has led to a dramatic reduction in fairness and competition, the things that many of the farmers today have been talking about. So the ways forward, uh, the report really points towards um, enforcement, establishment of much stronger antitrust uh, mechanisms and rules, things that you are investigating, stronger competition policies, including regulations that look at global and international competition. And uh, I would encourage you to, to go from one of the suggestions in the report about uh, cooperating with other governments to establish an international review mechanism that would look at the transnational effects of corporate control over um, uh, inputs and over the food system. And so finally, you'll be... just to say that, you know, I know some of these things may seem like out of the purview of, of the antitrust division or out of this particular investigation, but that is why we and all of our members would like to call on the Department of Justice and the Department Ag of Agriculture to broaden the scope of this investigation. Um, this is an important beginning, but really what, in order to establish the vibrant, um, local 
uh, food systems that are what will save family farmers and will bring this country back on its feet is going to require a much deeper investigation. Our agricultural science is on the line, um, good governance is at stake, and human health is on the line as well. And so we put forward this uh, request that you work together and bring in uh, con Congress as well to really broaden the investigation in a thorough and transparent way. And you'll be submitting your report onto our website also? Yes. That'd yes, be great. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so I, I'm guessing uh, the, the I, I had assumed on the people had come up, had been on, but I take it we have people now who have not, the numbers we've called, is that the observation? Um, so uh, why don't we uh, go, uh, we'll let you speak and why don't we go for the last numbers, we're going to follow, pick up five more numbers because then we'll, others have been waiting here. So. And I assume everyone who wants to be took a number, so let's read the numbers here. 518-484-502-480-520. Um, those people could line up uh, if they're here. Uh, in the meantime, we'll let you can go ahead. Thanks. My name is Sienna Chrisman. I'm here from Why Hunger, formerly World Hunger Year in New York City, and I'm also with the U.S. Working Group on the Food Crisis. Um, I work with, among other people, uh, many low-income communities in New York and around the country and around the world. And I'd really like to make a point on a couple of points on cheap food. We've heard a lot about um, that we need a lot of these technologies and, and we need this current system of agriculture that we have now to be able to produce the volume that we need to feed a hungry world. Um, my first point is that in the, in the food crisis a year and a half ago, <clears throat> when uh, price were, prices for food were spiking and there were riots around the world and farmers were having a really tough time with, with inputs, the, the top three grain producers had prices, showed price increases at that point in that period of 67 to 89 percent. So they were making money at the same time that both farmers and the consumers were really hurting. My second point is that yes, there is cheap food that's available in, around the country and, and in low-income areas, both urban and rural, but the food that's available, I don't know if you've been to a lot of low-income areas around the country, rural and urban, a lot of it can really barely be called food. It's calories, but that's not providing health to anyone. And that brings me to my third point, that cheap food is not, is not really cheap. The externalities that come with our cheap food are very real, and we're going to have to pay them at some point sooner or later, whether that's in our soil quality, on which all of our food is, is growing, in our rural economies, and in our health. One in three kids, I'm sure you know, born after 2000, is predicted to develop diabetes. It's unbelievable to me that we're able to talk about health care and not be talking about the kind of food that we have available, available in our communities. Many consumers are losing out in this system just as much as farmers are. And as, Mar as Marcia said, as other people have said, there, there really are other ways to explore to feed the world. Um, small and mid-scale locally based, regionally based agriculture, it's not just a niche thing. It needs the opportunity to compete. It needs the opportunity to, to scale up, to have processing infrastructure, as we've heard about. It really needs the ability to have a la level playing field and, and be able to, to be another real option. And finally, I'd just like to, to say I really appreciate that in December we'll be having a panel looking at hearing from consumers, and I'd like to recommend that we have another panel at some point during the year to also hear from more voices of consumers, because this is about our food system and who controls our food system, and we all eat, and we all really need to be able to have the opportunity to speak out on this just as much as the producers have. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, I thank you for having this today. I'm Larry Shover, diversified. We have a diversified farm in northeast Iowa, uh, crops, dairy, hogs, and beef. Um, I, I would like to address, re reinforce several great points I think we've heard today. We've heard a number of great ideas. Um, I'd like to disagree a little bit with what was said before. I know the horses may be out of the barn, but we can get them back in again. We can't get in front of the train, get run over, but maybe we can turn it a little bit. Uh, we have a resilient people, resilient economy, and I think if we make the system halfway fair, level playing field, as Secretary Vilsack has said, we can change things. I think most important point we've heard today is about the retail and mar retail margins. I believe the retailers have too much power. We can all be concerned about the processors, and I am. But we, the retailers have taken an ever greater share of the retail dollar, and that has um, hampered our processing and especially our production sectors. Uh, by taking those extra margins, they've uh, taken away in a, money for innovations and strength in, in, our, in our sectors. Uh, by uh, expanding their margins in time of up markets, and by lagging down markets, they do two things. They, they keep their profits for a longer time. And we all know that consumers have uh, demand that's, that's uh, influenced somewhat by the prices. And so as they keep those prices higher than they should be, they tend to stifle demand, shorten the up cycles, and lengthen the down cycles by in increasing inventories and keeping those inventories longer than they should have been. Um, second, we do have too much consolidation in the packing industry. We're greatly affected by that in our pork, pork sector. We are still part of the open market. We are an independent uh, farrow to finish operation, so we are rare indeed. Uh, I know um, there are reasons for contracting and so forth, but I agree with Chuck Wirtz that we need to make an effort to increase that. Livestock ownership of packers should again be limited to 10 to 14 days prior to slaughter. The supply contracts, and I agree with what was said by several times, when they have 90 to 95 percent of their supply lined up, why would they ever bid hard for that last 5 percent? They'd better let those slots stay empty rather than increase the price on the rest of the 95. Sustainability. We've, we've all heard that term a lot, but I think one point that's been overlooked is that sustainability needs margins in an industry, enough profits from within to renew itself for facilities, systems, and most importantly, people. Shown a reasonable chance to make a de decent living if we give them a, a level playing field, our young people will come back. You can wind up. At present, um, I believe we should look at 1031 tax exchanges. They, they encourage excessive investment that isn't needed at many times. As a dairy farmer, I'm grateful for my cooperative Dairy Farmers of America and our sister co-ops throughout the country that help to represent us and strengthen our position in the marketplace and public policy. I wish, frankly, that a similar effort was viable, f uh, viable for our hog and beef enterprises, and I urge you to help s defend and strengthen Capra Volstead. I believe that we need more public investment in research and seed, especially conventional vari varieties, forages, and sustainable livestock and farming and marketing systems. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Angie Tagtoe, and I'm a uh, registered dietitian here in Iowa working on public health and food access issues. And I want to remind us of some natural laws in this discussion. Natural law number one, food is a basic human need. We're talking about food. Law number two, food is our source of health and well-being. And law number three, those who controlled our food supply control societies. And even though Wendell Berry said that eating is an agricultural act, health is an agricultural act. Nourishing societies begins with seed, soil, water, and sunlight. 
Diverse seed grows diverse crops. Diverse crops cultivate diverse jobs, resulting in economic vitality, especially in rural areas. Diverse crops puts diverse foods on our plates. And diverse foods are the key to not only healthy individuals, but families, our farms, and communities. The vertical and horizontal consolidation and concentration within any sector of the food system has and will continue to limit our access to foods that promote health. Having diverse foods makes eating healthful foods easier choices. This thereby can make an impact not only the health of eaters, and, but especially children and future generations. Seventy years ago, there were more than 34 different crops that were grown in Iowa farms, half of which were fruits and vegetables. Today, there are only 10 crops that are grown on Iowa farms, none of which are fruits and vegetables, and many that are not even designed for human consumption. In fact, less than 0.1% of farmland in Iowa grows foods that promote health, primarily fruits and vegetables. But a paradox exists today that 30 million acres in Iowa are devoted to agriculture. Yet 12% of Iowans, and even more Iowans today than a few years ago, do not have regular access to food. As a result, and it's estimated that about 80% of the foods that appear on Iowans eat Iowans plates are actually brought into Iowa. As a result of this corporate control of Iowa's food system, Iowa agriculture doesn't even feed Iowans. This is a national security issue. As eaters, we all should share responsibility and ownership of the food system, as this would assure that all, we all have regular access to safe, nutritious foods that not only support our health and well-being, but for future generations as well. Thank you. Thank you. I know we're a little past our any time, and we're down to the really hard core, but I want to ask a couple more people if they're still here, figure two more, um, 394 and 405, and then after that, we'll wind it up, um, reminding you all this is the beginning of a process. We're getting a lot of great ideas. We really appreciate you staying with us. Um, thank you, sir. My name is Larry Ginter. I'm a retired family farmer. I grew up in the 40s when agriculture was truly sustainable, not like today truly ethical, not like today. Mr. Brad Wilson was right. We need a further debate. But when we have the foxes guarding the chicken coop, we, are, we have big problems. Secretary of Agriculture, uh, Vilsack carried water for the giant hog factories. Our Lieutenant Governor, Patty Judge, carried water for the vertical integrators. Governor Branstead, who wants to be governor again, carried water for the vertical integrators. Folks, we have a problem of ethics. But I'd like to talk about a Catholic priest who once felt that breaking the sixth commandment, thou shalt not steal. You, if you could break that commandment and rob from your friends and rob from other nations, you would probably break all the other commandments. And you would take your nation down into perdition. We never talked about the ethics of our trade laws. We produce corn on the cheap. Family farmers aren't being paid ethically at the farm gate. Giant hog factories like Smithfield gobble up that cheap grain and profit for the tune of two to three billion dollars since 1994 to 2001. We send that cheap corn down into Mexico and we drive millions of family farmers, we disrupt their marketplace and drive millions of family farmers off the land. That's ethical, but that's business as usual for Smithfield. And then they get cheap labor. That suits them fine. And then the Department of Justice allows Smithfield to buy premium standard farms we have a problem. You ought to be ashamed of yourselves for allowing this to happen. I got driven out of the hog, out of the hog business along with thousands and thousands of family farmers in the state of Iowa because of vertical integration. Monsanto can now patent seeds that through eons of evolution, they didn't create the seed. Nature did. 
well, I'm going to shut my mouth now, but we better be damn sure what we're doing. Because what we're doing is wrong. Mighty wrong. Smithfield's operating in Poland. Drove 60% of those family farmers out of business. They're operating in Romania. Drove 80% of those family farmers out of business. They're operating in Brazil, driving thousands of those farmers out of business. And they're not a monopoly? Let's get real. Well, I'll, I'll quit now. I'm, Ver I'm Vern Tigas. I'm a small farmer from Carroll, Iowa. I'm also president of Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement, a small advo advocacy group here in Iowa that uh, seeks all avenues of social justice. And social justice is what it's all about. The corporations have... Uh, gotten all the facets of our economy covered, including our politics. And uh, they do this, they are in control of our economy, they control our politics because they can. And all laws and all policies are created by man and those who can influence them. And that is the problem where we stand today. We don't have social justice. We have policies and laws that are created by man and the corporations and the people that can influence those people. So it's not a fair world as it stands right now. And that's why we are in this dilemma now. It's not only ag. It is all facets of our economy, including banking, all the financial sectors. Last night, I was at a workshop, and I asked, and I don't know if I can do it here, I asked all those who raised livestock prior to 1995, please stand up. Prior to 1995, all those who raised livestock, okay, stay standing. All those who had ag-related jobs in any, sec uh, uh, any sector of agriculture before 1995, please stand up. Okay, out of all these people, and I'm sure there's many people that left, out of all these people who have lost their job or have gotten out of livestock production since 1995, please sit down. That doesn't leave very many standing, does it? The proportion was a lot larger last night. Last night, half of the people stood up, and when I was finished, there were three people standing. So you see, it is the corporate structure that took over the agriculture in the last 15 years, that put these people out of business, caused people to lose their jobs. And it is for that reason, I'm not calling on you, I'm, I'm calling on you to go ahead with this antitrust procedure because all of us eat and all of us have, have to have a job and we all have to, provide for our families. So I'm asking those all in favor of going ahead with this procedure of antitrust, please stand up. This is the picture that I wanted you to see. Thank you, I appreciate I that. You. We have one last person whose ticket's called and I want to give him a chance to speak and then uh, give people a chance to go home. Thank you for staying with us. Yes, sir. I actually do have a number. No, I, I know. <laughs> Somehow. Did you, uh, you as well recall? That's fine. Let two more people Okay. Then. Thank you for this opportunity and your patience. Um, just a little different twist on some of this. Uh, 
I'm a farmer from Harlan, Iowa. I have a written statement. Larger factors than violations of antitrust laws play into the seed industry's assertion that biotech seeds are in the best interest of feeding the world now and in the future. I believe it's accus accusations that organic and conventional crop breeding cannot do so are scientifically flawed. It ignores the scientific data from many long-term agronomic studies from both private institutions, institutions such as the Rodale Research Institute and from pub public land-grant institutions such as Iowa State. These studies show that natural cropping systems can produce similar yields while reducing fertilizer and pesticide usage, decrease energy usage, decrease CO2 emissions, are done with cheaper production costs and greater economic efficiencies. And then at the same time, this bias from these companies insists that its ability to feed the world's hungry in the future can only be accomplished by the commodity large-scale export model that removes farmers from their lands and communities all over the world. I recently spent 11 days with my son, who's an agricultural worker in the Peace Corps in Honduras. And I saw firsthand that these people need access to markets and help in green farming practices. And I was appalled to learn from my son that four out of five supermarkets in this country of seven million in Honduras are controlled by Walmart. I've been an on-farm researcher and a I'm a biologist and a farmer. I've been an on-farm researcher for 23 years now in cooperation with the Practical Farmers of Iowa and Iowa State University. I've been an organic farmer for 27 years and a certified one for 16 years. I can now grow 200 bushel corn and 65 bushel beans on a consistent basis. I couldn't do it after the first 10 years but now, after 27 years, I can do it. I can do it because of being a, a diversified crop and livestock farmer in the best history and tradition of our state and our Midwest. And now, I am doing it with less expensive conventional non-biotech seeds. We are now reaping the benefits of soil building crop rotations, animal manure and compost for soil and plant health and we are producing a more nutrient-dense food for better human nutrition. The takeover of small plant breeding companies by just three or four companies has diminished our seed genetic diversity and has greatly eroded our public institution's ability and responsibility for creating new seeds that serve the public good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Randy Jesper. My son and I operate a dairy and grain farm in southern Wisconsin. Uh, and you were wondering, I'll keep this short, by the way. Uh, one of the things you was talking about, what you can do, the DOJ right now has an investigation against Dairy Farms of America for price fixing. Uh, that'd be one thing you could do is proceed on that one. Uh, also, we're looking forward to the dairy. I'm about 60 miles from Madison, so we're looking forward to the hearing there. Thank you. Thank you.